Today we are looking at a case from the first part of the 20th century. So sit back as we go to the USA. Edward Wheeler Hall was born on the 12th of June 1881 in Kings County, New York, into a deeply religious family with strong ties to the Episcopal Church. He was the eldest of two children born to Edward Douglas Hall, a devoted churchgoer and respected community member, and Fanny Burstow Hyde Hall, who came from a family with a long-standing tradition of religious involvement. Both parents highly valued education and instilled in their children a strong sense of duty and morality. Edward attended local schools in Brooklyn, where he excelled academically and demonstrated an early interest in religious studies. His parents encouraged his intellectual curiosity and nurtured his developing faith. After completing his secondary education, Edward studied further and not only received a rigorous academic education, but he also became deeply involved in religious activities. Recognising his potential, his parents supported his decision when he decided that he wanted to pursue a career in the clergy. After completing his undergraduate studies, he attended a theological seminary in New York City, where he received comprehensive theological and pastoral training. Known for his eloquence, compassion and dedication, he eventually became the rector of the St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church in New Brunswick in New Jersey. Here he was a popular figure, his sermons were praised for their depth and clarity, and his pastoral care was highly valued. He tirelessly supported his community through various social and charitable activities, earning widespread respect and admiration for his charisma and genuine concern for his parishioners. In 1911, Edward married Frances Noel Stevens, a woman from a prominent New Brunswick family who was seven years his senior. However, from the moment they walked down the aisle, they were whispers that the Reverend's true motive in marriage was not love, but his wife's substantial fortune. Despite their different backgrounds, Edward, who had been raised in a modest home, and Frances, whose parents were known for their wealth and influence, the marriage appeared to be happy. However unknown to most, it was actually fraught with underlying tensions, particularly concerning financial matters, social expectations, and Edward's fondness for certain female members of his congregation. One such lady was named Mrs. Eleanor Reinhardt Mills. She was from New Brunswick, having been born there in 1888. She had a humble upbringing and possessed a strong passion for singing. In 1905, she had married Mr. James Mills, a devoted individual who balanced the roles of acting sexton at St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church and a full-time janitor at Lord Sterning Elementary School. Together they had two children, Charlotte born in 1906 and Daniel born four years later in 1910. Eleanor was known for her contributions as a choir singer at St. John the Evangelist Episcopal Church. Not only did she sing at the services, she also faithfully attended choir practice. However, unsettling rumours have began to circulate, suggesting that Mrs. Eleanor Mills was engaged in an improper relationship with the Reverend Edward Wheeler Hall. On the morning of the 16th of September 1922, a man named Raymond Schneider and a young lady named Pearl Barmer were walking in a secluded area on De Russes Lane, located near Phillips Farm near the western outskirts of New Brunswick. Apparently, they were searching for mushrooms. As they approached a crab apple tree, they noticed a man and a woman lying underneath it, their feet pointing towards the tree. However, something did not seem right. The woman's face was covered with a shawl, and the man's face was obscured by a hat. Raymond approached the couple, but they did not move. Feeling anxious, he carefully lifted the man's hat, but he was met with a gruesome sight. The man was dead, having been shot once in the head. He then removed the woman's shawl. She too was dead, having been shot three times, once under the right eye, once in the right temple, and once above the right ear. Additionally, her throat had been cut. It also appeared that the bodies had been deliberately positioned in a manner suggesting a ritualistic display. Their arms had been placed so they almost touched each other. Raymond and Pearl quickly hurried away to inform the authorities. Two policemen soon arrived, and immediately began to survey the area. They realised there was no sign of a weapon, indicating that the couple had probably been murdered. As they examined the surroundings more closely, they noticed a calling card, 
which seemed to have been carefully placed at the man's feet. Scattered around the bodies were torn up letters. The policeman painstakingly pieced them together and discovered that they were filled with expressions of love and affection, adding a poignant and tragic element to the scene. In their meticulous observations, the officers noted several key details about the woman. She was wearing a wedding ring, and beside her lay a blue velvet hat. Her attire was distinctive, a red polka dot dress that stood out vividly against the sombre surroundings. These details not only provided clues about her possible identity, but also added to the macabre display that confronted the investigators. However, the initial investigation was complicated by a jurisdictional issue. The crime scene was near the border between the counties of Somerset and Middlesex. Although the police from New Brunswick, located in Middlesex County, had arrived first, it was soon discovered that the crime scene was actually within Franklin Township in Somerset County. As the authorities worked to resolve this confusion, and word spread about the two dead bodies in Duras's lane, the site was suddenly overrun by morbid curiosity seekers who walked all over the area and even took souvenirs. The calling card was passed among the crowds, further contaminating the scene. As a result, the physical evidence was severely compromised, hampering the investigation from the outset. Eventually, Detective George Totten from the Somerset County Police Department took control. He moved along the crowd and arranged for the bodies to be taken to the mortuary so an autopsy could take place. This was conducted by the coroner, Dr. R. M. Long, who concluded that both had been dead for at least 36 hours and that they had been killed by a .32 caliber gun. He could not conclusively say whether they had been killed in the spot where they were eventually discovered. It did not take long for the bodies to be identified. The gentleman was Edward Wheeler Hall, the 41-year-old reverend at the St. John Episcopal Church. It was his calling card that had been placed at the scene. He had been reported missing by his wife, Mrs. Frances Stevens Hall, about 24 hours earlier. She had told the police that she had not seen her husband since the evening of Thursday the 14th of September. The lady was identified to be 33-year-old Mrs. Eleanor Reinhardt Mills, a married woman with two children and someone who was well known to the Reverend as she sang in the church choir. But what could explain such a terrible crime against two well-respected and well-liked members of the local community? As the investigation continued, detectives discovered that Reverend Hall's gold watch was missing, yet his wallet, containing a few coins, was found in his pocket. Mrs Mills had been wearing jewellery, which remained untouched. Giving these observations, robbery was quickly ruled out as a motive. On the 18th of September, Mrs Mills was buried at the Van Lu Cemetery. It was reported that less than a dozen mourners attended and that the reef on top of the coffin had been paid for by Mrs Frances Stevens Hall, the wife of the late Reverend. Reverend Hall was buried the same day in the Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. The police were confident that they would soon find the person or persons responsible for the murders. So the day after the funerals, the assistant prosecutor, Mr John E. Toulon, indicated that there may be an arrest at any time. Although he did not divulge exactly where the arrest might be made, whether the suspect was male or female, or how soon the person may be taken into custody. Detectives had learnt about the improper relationship between the two victims, and this had become the central element of the investigation. Mrs. Eleanor Reinhardt Mills was married to Mr. James Mills, the church sexton. She was known for her vibrant personality and dedication to the church choir, but her marriage to James was reportedly unhappy, marked by financial struggles and emotional dissatisfaction. It had been suggested by people that knew her that this dissatisfaction had made her susceptible to the attentions of the Reverend, whose charm and position may have seemed like a romantic escape from her mundane and difficult life. Although the police learned of this relationship, rumours about the affair between Edward Wheeler Hall and Eleanor Reinhardt Mills were already known within the New Brunswick community. Despite their attempts at secrecy, their frequent private meetings and affectionate interactions had not gone unnoticed. Parishioners and locals gossiped about the couple's clandestine rendezvous, and it was known that they often met in secluded areas and even inside the church. The illicit relationship not only provided a motive for the murders, but also added a layer of sensationalism to the case. When the bodies were discovered, together with torn up love letters beside them, it had transformed from a simple murder investigation 
into a lurid tale of passion and betrayal. The public and the press were fascinated by the scandalous details, and the affair became a focal point of the comprehensive media coverage. James Mills, now a widower following the death of his wife, was a suspect due to his direct connection to the victims and a potential motive rooted in his wife's behaviour. Investigators speculated that he might have discovered the affair and driven by jealousy and rage, committed the murders. Despite these suspicions, James Mills seemed to be suffering with genuine distress and cooperated fully with the investigation. He provided a detailed alibi, claiming he was home working on the night of the murders. This was confirmed by his two children and a neighbour who told police that he had complained about the noise Mr Mills was making. There was also no evidence that could place him at the scene. However, Mr Mills had said that he went to the church before he went to bed and again in the early hours of the morning in search of his wife. He went back at 9am where he bumped into Mrs Francis Stevens Hall and she told him that her husband had also failed to come home. Miss Charlotte Mills told officers that on the day her mother had disappeared, she had discussed the possibility of divorce with her. Witnesses came forward who had seen Mrs Eleanor Reinhardt Mills alone in the Russes Lane on the evening of Thursday the 14th of September. Reverend Edward Wheeler Hall had also been seen there at 9pm. The police also learned that Mrs Mills had telephoned the Hall household twice that evening without managing to get through to the Reverend. The investigation, however, did not seem to be progressing, so by late October, it was put in the hands of Special Prosecutor Wilbur A. Mott. The focus then shifted from Mr Mills to Mrs Frances Stevens Hall. She was a serious-looking woman with an outwardly calm demeanour. Investigators wondered if she had known about her husband's infidelity and believing he was about to leave her, had murdered both her husband and the woman she considered responsible for his betrayal. They speculated that she may have done this in order to preserve her social standing and avoid public humiliation. When questioned, however, she maintained her innocence and presented a solid alibi to counter the accusations. She claimed that on the night of the murders, she was home and this was confirmed by her maid, a young lady named Louise Geist. The police were not convinced by this story and continued to investigate. But not only Mrs Francis Stevens Hall, they also investigated her brothers, Henry and William. Henry was a reclusive character who had a reputation for erratic behaviour and William was known to have intellectual disabilities. And of course, both had potential motives to protect their sister's honour and their shared family name. Witnesses had come forward who said that they had seen them not far from the crime scene on the night of the murders and their actions following the discovery of the bodies were considered suspicious. Nonetheless, the lack of concrete evidence and the fact that they were from a prominent family of wealth and high social status complicated the efforts to build a strong case against them. Although the police had not made any arrests, the Hall Mills murder case, as it had been dubbed by the press, had become known nationwide. Newspapers across the country provided daily updates and sensational accounts of the investigation. The scandalous details of the affair between Reverend Hall and Mrs Mills, coupled with the gruesome nature of their murders, had completely captured the public's imagination. A lady came forward who emerged as a pivotal but controversial witness. Her name was Mrs Jane Gibson, who the press gave the name Pig Woman due to her occupation as a pig farmer. Her account of what happened that night added intrigue to an already sensationalised case. She told officers that she was awoken on the 14th of September by the sound of raised voices. She said that she went outside to see what was going on and saw four figures in the darkness. One was a woman in a long coat, who she later identified to be Mrs Francis Stevens Hall. According to Mrs Gibson, she heard a heated argument and saw a man fall to the ground after being shot. She also heard a woman shout, don't, before more gunshots rang out. She then said that she saw the woman fall to the ground. The investigation into the murder of Reverend Edward Wheeler Hall and Mrs Eleanor Reinhardt Mills had been led by Joseph E. Stricker, but the authorities believed that there was not enough evidence to charge anyone. Following this, the investigation was scaled down, leaving the case unsolved and shrouded in mystery. Over the next four years, public interest in the case persisted, but it wasn't until 1926 that the next significant development surfaced. This occurred when Mr Arthur Real 
who in 1924 had married Louise Geist, Mrs. Frances Stevens Hall's maid, filed for divorce. Mr. Real claimed that his wife had told him that her mistress knew that her husband was planning to leave her and ran off with Mrs. Eleanor Mills. According to his statement, Mrs. Stevens Hall, accompanied by her two brothers, confronted the couple late on Thursday, September the 14th, 1922, in De Russ's Lane. The brothers then killed them both in order to protect their sister's honour. He added that his wife had been paid to keep silent about these events. When these allegations reached the press, it reignited suspicion and speculation surrounding the case. Although Mrs. Louise Real dismissed this as nonsense, her husband's remarks and the press coverage that followed caught the attention of Governor A. Harry Moore, prompting him to order a second investigation. This decision marked a turning point in the case as a renewed effort began to uncover the truth and bring justice to the victims. Eventually it was decided that there was enough evidence to prosecute Mrs. Frances Stevens Hall, along with her brothers, Mr. Henry and Mr. William Stevens. Another family member was also initially charged, named Henry Carpenter. However, he never faced court. He'd only ever emerged as a suspect due to his close family ties, but he had an alibi for the night in question and there was a lack of evidence against him. However, before the trial began, it was discovered that Mrs. Eleanor Mills' original autopsy report had been misplaced. Consequently, her body was exhumed and a new autopsy was conducted. This resulted in a new grim discovery. On the night she was murdered, her tongue had been cut out. The trial eventually started on the 3rd of November 1926 in Somerville, New Jersey. It proved to be a great spectacle, attracting vast public and media attention. Mrs. Stevens Hall hired the best defence team available, led by Robert H. McCarter, a well-known and high-profile attorney. Testimonies from various witnesses painted a picture of jealousy, conspiracy and a potential cover-up. Particularly compelling was the testimony of Jane Gibson, known as the Pig Woman. Despite being terminally ill and brought to court in a hospital bed, her account drew significant attention. However, the prosecution struggled to establish her as a reliable witness. Her statements were full of inconsistencies and her descriptions of the events that had happened on the evening of the 14th of September 1922 had changed multiple times. This, along with her eccentric personality, made her a target for ridicule by the defence and the press. There were credible witnesses, such as one man, who testified that he had seen Henry Stevens near the crab apple tree on the day of the murders. However, his delayed disclosure of this evidence, coming many months after the murders, allowed the defence to undermine its significance. Intriguingly, a fingerprint belonging to William Stevens was found on the business card that had been placed at Edward Wheeler Hall's feet. The defence, however, argued that the compromised crime scene had meant that the card had likely been handled by many people, thus once again diminishing its significance. Ultimately, the evidence remained circumstantial, enabling the defence to effectively highlight the lack of direct proof linking their clients to the crime. The trial ended on the 3rd of December 1926 and the jury found all three defendants not guilty. A verdict that only deepened the mystery and the public's fascination with the case. Following the trial, Mrs. Frances Stevens Hall attempted to resume a normal life, but the stigma of the case lingered. She remained in New Brunswick and continued to live in the house she had once shared with Edward. She passed away in 1942 never having remarried or publicly discussing the case again. Over the decades, numerous theories have emerged about the motivations and identities of those responsible for this most horrible crime. The most straightforward theory suggests the murders were driven by jealousy and a desire to preserve family honour. With Mrs. Frances Stephen Hall humiliated by her husband's affair, possibly enlisting her brothers to kill Edward and Eleanor, Another theory suggests a robbery gone wrong, with Edward and Eleanor shot after being discovered by robbers. However, the lack of missing valuables and the ritualistic display of the bodies weakens this argument. Some have speculated that a spurned lover might have committed the murders in a fit of rage, but this theory lacks substantial evidence and is largely conjectural. A more complex theory involves a broader conspiracy, potentially involving influential individuals in New Brunswick. Proponents of this theory argue that the investigation was deliberately mishandled to protect certain parties from exposure. 
This is highlighted by the numerous procedural errors and inconsistencies in the investigation, which may suggest a possible cover-up. Advances in forensic science and legal standards have led to renewed interest in the Hall Mills case. Modern forensic techniques such as DNA analysis and advanced ballistic testing could potentially shed new light on the case. However, the contamination and loss of evidence from the original investigation pose significant challenges. The case remains one of the most intriguing unsolved mysteries in American criminal history. The combination of scandal, social intrigue and gruesome violence captivated the public and left an indelible mark on the cultural landscape. Despite numerous theories and extensive investigation, the true perpetrators of the murders have never been definitively identified and although many believe that Mrs Frances Stevens Hall and her brothers William and Henry got away with murder, the case is still somewhat shrouded in mystery. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case.